Good afternoon. So today we will discuss about electron microscopes. That is mainly on scanning electron microscope and transmission electron microscope. So in last class I have uh, told a little bit basic about the electron microscope. So this I have already discussed why we, we require electron microscope. As the electron has much shorter wavelength than visible light so that it allows electron microscope you know, to produce higher resolution image. The normal standard light microscope and being it's you know the interaction the shorter strongest interaction with nature so you can get many type of information so in addition it is high intensity with and high energy that can relatively you can generate more easily and it can be used in conjugation with variety of uh, other techniques so and in case of uh, this electron microscope your lambda is in the range of 0 0.002 2.1 nanometer depending upon the you know that energy of the electron so you have a large you know tunable you know lambda that you can able to get in this case and you can able to see quite smaller objects because of that uh, you know with a shorter wavelength you can see material in the order of wavelength so uh, coming to the different types of interaction in case of electron microscope for you that in the, especially in scanning electron microscope, we use these backscatter electrons and secondary electrons. That I have discussed that when electron beam fall and interact with a particular material, so that electron itself can return back with that we call backscatter electron, or it can generate, produce a second another electron, so that will be a secondary electron. So these two type of electrons can be used in case of scanning electron microscope. So the secondary electrons are you know, low energy electron as compared to the backscatter electrons and addition that whatever the transmitted electron come crossing, crossing across the sample so that will be used for your you know, transmission electron microscope so mainly that SCM will be based on the two types of electron that one is the backscatter electron and the secondary electrons whereas TM will be based on transmitted electrons so now first coming into scanning electron microscope so if you the Scanning electron microscope is a type of electron microscope that produces image of a sample by scanning across the surface. That means you have a raster scanner, so that scanner you know, scans on the sample surface, you know, it's pixel by pixel, and you get a focused um, image that is produced. So mainly, it's, it's the name of the scanning is coming from that the raster scan that scans the surface. An electron interact with the atom in the sample producing various type of signal and that contain information about the material like the incoming electron or, or the, the that getting back their backscatter or second electron coming from the sample so that electron contains lots of information about the sample surface so if you see the historical background the first SEM was built is quite big and large in Germany by Professor Noll and um, in the USA 1940s and it became real practical reality of this by Professor Sir Charles Otale Lab in Cambridge in 1950 and then the concept you know so I slow it matured and by the time a recent time you will get a very small uh, size you know for tabletop ACMs are now available you can see how big is this unique fast ACM that developed by that Snow and that coin. So, so with progress, it's now it's reduced. So it's mostly that SEM gives you four type of information. The first one is your topography. You can able to see what the surface feature of an object or how it looks. Like in a, like normal microscope that you see the surface property. So those things can also be at high resolution, at a smaller scale. You can able to see by using the SEM. You can able to get that uh, in the relation between the these features and the material characteristics. So how the material is dependent upon different, you know, topographic image that, that you can see. You can also see the morphology that is shape and size of the particle of an object in relation to this feature features like you can able to whether the particle is spherical or it is, you know, elongated or is cylindrical, those information you can see. You can see these two SEM image that first one is in intergranular structure you can see so how these different types of grains the how it looks so this type of image you can able to see the surface morphology and the intragranular inside that if you go inside this further magnified 
you can able to see uh, where some other image that in the, how these pores are in the intracellular structures. So those features you can able to see topography and in your addition you can measure the size of these grains and you can also get idea about the shape of this you know particular structure. In addition it can also gives composition of the uh, that elements or compounds of that object is made up of. So those information will get if you have a copper oxide you can get information about copper and oxygen how much copper and how much oxygen is present so th those things you can quantify also and in addition you can also get you know crystallographic information how atoms like high resolution SEM like the FPG SEM you can able to get some sort of information about you know atomic arrangement and the relation the those relation in, with the quality of the material so if you go into the SCM, so in SCM you have a magnification range of 15 x to you know, 2 lakhs, you can go up to quite high magnification and there is a resolution of 50 angstrom. Now the next it is in comparison to normal conventional microscope, it has an excellent depth of focusing. So you can, that since electron is high in the penetration than the light, so you are able to get you know more in-depth information like you can go a little depth, you can see the structure. And in sample preparation is quite easy in case of SCM. For example, if you have a conducting sample, so there is no preparation you can at all say or very little preparation. You directly put your powder sample or a that particular chunk of sample or a you know, sample stuff, that brass stuff or steel stuff that is available on that uh, you can put directly or you can give in that you know, carbon tape you can also put for those parts give the particle and you are able to see the microstructure but if it is not conducting in that case you have to you know coat with a thin layer of conducting things like either you have to give gold or pore, carbon or chromium coating it's weaker so if you not use this coating on the non-conducting surface but if you have a sample here you know, on this place and coming electron beam are falling here because of that you know this lots of electron coming and you will get a charging effect so what are, because of that you will be able to see you know white completely white screen instead of your feature so that you to nullify that charging effect in case of non-conducting non -conducting sample you have to use this type of coating layer you can see that uh, that the energy can be varied if you have a 10 kb electron micro SEM your wavelength is about 0.1 to angstrom or is 100 kb to a 0 0.03 so you can depending upon the instrument's energy of that uh, you know time electron energy so you're able to get different lambda value and the sample states can be tilted you know so that you can get you know uh, in internal information but it has a specific limit you can go beyond certain uh, tilting angle because of that you have a chamber inside that chamber you have sample is here so this you can tilt in up to certain angle and to see the structure of the morphology or you can see the cross-sectional image, so but if you are certain angle, you can't able to take it because it's confined in a sample chamber. You can see in comparison to optical microscope, you can see here it's quietly you know the high resolution. You can see this is a this is an optical microscope of a 2D structure that is here of uh, barium titanate. When that one you will able to see in case of you know SEM, you can see in the SEM you are able to see the internal structures, how the growth states are there in this particular sample. Here in case of optical microscope, you can see just you are able to get a grain boundary information or something. So you can see, so mainly optical microscope gives the just showing the, the boundary nature of the particular sample, whereas even internal structure, it is a two-dimensional, three-dimensional, those information you are able to get in case of SCM. You can see that this is a particular, in that radio, radio a radio area in a particular you can see it's a virus that image you can see in case of optical microscope you can see that star like structure where here you can see these dendritics or this spikes that is clearly visible as well as the internal morphology you can able to see in case of SEM because of you know high resolution that the SEM has you no know, large depth of field so it's allowed large amount of sample to be focused at a time and you can produce image that good representation of the three-dimensional structure. So combination of higher magnification, large depth, and generation of greater resolution and compositional or crystal information make a CM more stronger or more useful than normal microscopes. So in case of optical, you have a small depth, 
and low resolution, whereas in case of ACL, we have large depth and we will use high resolution when able to get. But in case of it's in ACL, that beam scans the specimen in a raster manner. Like if a beam, uh, that sample on that surface beam pulse, and it scans, you know, step by step, it scans in a raster manner. So the signal produced at the beam spot is placed at each position, in turn collected and used to control a bright brightness of display beam which writes the image screen. So you at each point where it falls, so you'll get a particular point. So because then that data is collected and it's able to get a particular image. You can see, if you see this is three dimensional three D century mosaic structure, you can see how these mosaics are arranged, you know, step by step attached to each other. So like that, your SCM microscope you know, span the sample pixel by pixel, a small, small area, it will scale and you can hold together and get a 3D image. You can see here, you have an object is here. On that object, you have a, you know, scan, a scanner is here, and that scan will be, you know, scan the data, and then it will collect, you know, throw a collector, and then what you will see, you will get, a, you know, whatever the signal that you're getting, that is to amplify, and finally it will display. You can a screen, you can able to see the internal structure of the material. If you see the electron microscope, that here you have some few important things are there. But one is you have a electron source at the top, so that will mainly produce the high energy electron. That electron is produced here. Then it goes to the you have a condenser lens here. That condenser lens is here, so that you have in between you have you know this different magnetic lenses will be there to enhance this. The kinetic energy of that, that electron will be further enhanced, so it fall onto the, the condenser lens, and then it can go through the aperture and finally fall and then on the sample surface. Yeah. So after falling on the sample surface through the objective lens, it will come across to form the sample, and you have a you know you can generate both backscatter electron as well as secondary electron, or you can generate X-rays. So that X-rays can be detected by you know EDAX facility of this. So mainly you have a specimen, on that specimen, you know, no, you have a backscatter electron is coming from, or a secondary electron, or a fluorescent X-ray that will come out from that. That, that the backscatter electron is mainly used for high energy compositional contrast. You will get, you know, when contrast you made in the composition analysis that must be used for backscatter electrons, and secondary electron will be mostly used for, you know, it's a, it's a low energy, you use them for topographic constant. Contrast, but it's fluorescent X-ray huge for composition analysis. What is the copper K? The K alpha, K beta is coming from different system. For example, in copper oxide, you'll get copper K alpha or copper K beta or copper K L alpha, or you can be able to get you know oxygen one A electron. So those you know from those type of mostly this copper thing you'll get. So that will be able to tell you the compositional structure. So brightness of the region of the image increases with the atomic number. Like the higher jet material, you will get more brighter image. And the less penetration gives mostly, you know, best, best cut electron will be, if the electron penetration is less, less that material is quite hard, in that case, you will get, you know, best cut electron is full. But the electron source that I told here, that you have an electron source that we mainly use, as it mainly, you know, tungsten filament we use as electron source, you can see, this is function filament, or you can use, you know, lab six lanthanum, barium hexafera hexaboride, or cerium hexaboride. So those type of crystals you have tip, you can see here. So those type of, you know, harmonic emission source. You used to because you use the heat of the source. So then after due to heating, the electron will generate. That's why you call it thermonic emission. Is or you can also use, you know, field emission gun source are there. So you have multiple anodes, so that because of the potential difference, you can able to get that production of, you know, this electrons. And this thermonic source mainly relies on heat to generate electrons, whereas field emission source, also called, you know, FEG, field emission gun, is a used in a strong electrostatic field to induce electron emission. Here, the point, multiple anodes are there, even anode 1, anode 2. So once that, uh, because of the potential difference, you will be able to get electrostatic potential, potential produced uh, high energy electron. So SCM records, requires high current density, that is electrons per unit area, and small electrons for as, as small as possible. 
So you mainly require a high current density and high energy electron for producing that uh, this type of you know uh, force pressure using. So mainly that I have already discussed that the tungsten and lab six are used. You can see that this is a you know uh, tungsten filament how it looks and it's a lab six you know, pointed tips is there in case of last fish. So in whole things we used to keep uh, here you can see this uh, this is the one leg cylinder inside that this is source which placed. So that will in one leg produce more negative bias. So because of that negative bias your electron energy this electron will come out and attain the sufficient kinetic energy through the magnetic lenses and finally fall on the sample. So you can see the anode here so to enhance that electron beam energy to so those type of you can use. So mostly that tip of tungsten needle is made up of very sharp less than 0.1 micron that you can see the sharp tips so because of the sharpness you can able to get higher you know electron, electron production capability in case of FEG you can use you know strong electric field it's used to extract the electron you can see here this is the uh, in the emitter is here so then you have a different electrodes are the anode are there so it produces high energy you know that electron will extract it because of that you know electric field mm -hmm. yes. So first anode is an extraction voltage and second anode is an act as electrostatic lenses. So that will attract that electron to come out and different extraction voltage for different operation modes generally huge. You can see that in case of tungsten, you have a, you know, that del energy is 1.5 to 0.3 per minimum energy required, you know, produce that electron source. And you can see that in case of uh, FEG gun, you can use it. Circuit effect system or even cold FEG are used as a source. You can see this is a particular how sharp is your electron uh, source in the case of FEG gun. So, the smaller the spot, higher the concentrated concentration, current density is compared to thermonic gun. Here, it's, you can see the tip is quite smaller. And in comparison to the earlier one, that tungsten filament here, you can see that it is quite broad, deep, or it is quite broad in comparison to this uh, thermonic, this uh, FEG gun. So, you are able to get you know high current density in this case. So, in, but in both cases, you need a high, applied high voltage, and then you whole system has to kept in a vacuum. You can see the vacuum is a border of 10 to the power minus 10 tungsten or is called FPG 10 to the power minus 8 or other. So you need a quite high vacuum to achieve all this, you know, this high energy electron production. So the, the voltage that you are affecting that it will you increase that you see the lambda is related to voltage, the initial voltage that you are using. So it will depends upon the resolution. It's increased if you have a high voltage and penetration will also increase. And uh, in case of, but in, the problem is in the insulator sample, you will get a specimen charging effect. And you can get better, you know, uh, that may also cause because of the high voltage, sometimes damage occurs. So you have to uh, use a balanced voltage so that where you will able to get high uh, energy electron and high current density as well as, you know, less damage to the sample. And the role of vacuum that you use mainly, like some of the these chemicals or, uh, you know, corrosion might be occurs in a thermal stability necessary well functioning the filament. Like you have a filament is there, so that filament has to be chemically stable, that is not a way corroded and it should be thermal, thermally stable. So that, that's why you need a vacuum in case of FEG, it is 10 to the minus 10 order, where it is lab 6, 10 to the minus 6 order. So the signal electron must travel from sample to detector in, a, in the vacuum, otherwise if there is some gas and all the things to, that electron can interact, so you know, no ionization process can happen, so that will interfere. So vacuum is the primary requirement and is dependent on types of detector. So if you have a, depending on the detector, the vacuum, that probability is 10 to the minus 10 or minus 6, that is you, not only, only the source not only decide, in addition the detector also decide how much vacuum you can do. You go, you can require for an SEM analysis. If you go to SEM optics, like normal, you know, this lens, my conventional lens, at one by U plus one by V equal to one by F. So similarly here also lens system, you can see many magnetic lenses, that glass lens are replaced in magnetic lenses in case of, you know, this is SEM. Uh, so it's the, the overall the, the basics of that, uh, you know, this one by U, plus one by B, one by F is the main same, only that lenses are replaced with, you know, 
magnetic lenses and these lenses will focus the beams and it also uh, to the particular uh, area sample and you can you can see here if a conventional microscope you can get in uh, through the light you will get an inverted image that you get here so magnification mainly depends upon the what is the distance between object to the uh, lens and uh, to the d d1 d2 by d1 that is the distance the image to the object d2 by d1 but you see the scanning electron microscope in case of scanning electron microscope you will get a direct image instead of inverted image here what you are getting in conventional you will get a direct image and so that will be displayed on a detector uh, you will detect that and display the image so here that uh, magnetic probe diameter is mainly decided the, that the, if a very narrow diameter or glass diameter that will decide you know how the image quality and resolution will be there so instead of registering image by eye or recording it in film we can see it in a tv or a screen display by using the scanning electron microscope and its resolution is mainly decided by the probe diameter how sharp is the probe whether in the in fg it's quite sharp you'll able to get you know better resolution image in comparison to tungsten or lab 6 filament in, in case of scn if you come the detector so the detector is the another important part, part so that detector is used to you know capture those you know that whatever the image is from the pixel by pixel data it will take and then it converted to the image so many two types of detectors is used in case of backscatter electron we use a solid state detector is here you usually have a sample here from the sample whatever the backscatter electron is coming out so that used to be collected by a circular detector that here it just top of the sample we get that uh, here so detector size is just above the sample then below the objective lens you have objective lens here and the then we this in between the this sample and that sample just above the sample in best are electron strike that are detected whatever the best are electron that strike on this detector that will be detected in case of backscatter electron so image are more sensitive to the chemical composition that electron will that the given the atomic number uh, electron depends on the atomic number how the electron is so most of the electron energy is, is quite low 30 to 50 keV uh, that is sorry the high energy 30 to 50 keV in this case so then you have a uh, annular uh, shaped uh, you can see here annular shaped mesh biased mesh is secondary electron detector is placed in the top but so you turn around uh, best cut electron the top of the sample surface but in case of secondary electron you can see the electron is one side here uh, that whatever the secondary electron coming out from the sample so that will be detected by the secondary electron the most detected this is a pmt detector or a scintillator detector is huge here that by uh, this is since it's the secondary electron that bias mass voltage is quite low the 100 to 300 volt needed in front of detector to attract the low energy electron since here the electron energy is quite high so you need you know high voltage is necessary in case of backscatter electron but in second electron most we use pmt or scintillator detector if you see the magnification part of the scn so the magnification or the image you are seeing here you can see the set mainly that image what you see it will enlarge by the you know that ccrt monitor and then you know, the whole thing will come come in the picture so what the magnification is lcrt by l specimen in this case so magnification is controlled by changing the strength of the scanning coil also you can see here area scan on the image you can see here the whole area is scanning here only eyes are scanning in the right image in this case yeah. you can see how the image is you know, getting enlarged in this case if you see the change in magnification that uh, it constant if the working distance is fixed and you can that you can see the image information here by changing the contrast uh, change the working distance it, but the image can be rotated but if you only change the magnification there will be no change no working distance change the same magnifying area you can magnify here in this case here you can see here when the working distance is constant changing working distance is a possibility that you may go some some other area or you can that image rotation is possible so magnification is mainly accompanied by scanning properties of a smaller portion of the specimen and display the image on the CRT. So total magnification is the square 
the area of the CRT divided by the area of the area scan. So total area on the CRT, the total area scan, so that will decide the magnification of the image. So, Something we have. Mm -hmm. yes, the yes. So you can also do walk like walking distance, like the depth of field you can see here. You have here focus point is your particular point. You can see here the focal plane in case of SCM is quite large. So by varying the walking distance, you can able to get you know the inside features also. You can see here you have a SCM image of a pollen. Here you can see that pollen structure in the bottom one. You can see the the one the walking distance is uh, changes, you can see how the image contrast is, you can see uh, very varies in both cases. So, walking distance initially case is 8 mm, top one, it is below 37 mm, you can see the, how the contrast variations. So, the de depth of field is the distance among the optical axis, either side of the focusing point that remains, you know, acceptable to focus. So, in either side, you have to, uh, this is the area, between this area, you can able to see the better quality image. So this is the height that has to over which the sample can be directly clearly focused. And SCM has a large depth of field in who that, that's why you can get a 3D structure for it you can be compared into conventional microscope. So that the depth field, the depth of field can be changed or improved by if you are changing a go for a longer walking distance or smaller objective aperture at lower magnification is able to get better quality of image by changing this. If you see this SCM image, you can see the SCM image focused, uh, the magnification will be still at the lower magnification. That very 10x magnification, you can see this image is, is focused. So the, the charging effect has to nullify by using some carbon or gold coating. This is a 10x you can able to see that it is the coil structure that you can able to see. So if you go slightly higher magnification that is 110x, you can see that particular area I have marked here. So this area I have enlarged and that area you can see here. So that area is whole area is you can see that 110 case you can read internal morphology. So for the, this small area that but if I zoom this area, I go a little higher magnification. You can see that I am now getting more information about the, how the, you know, defined this type of grains or something there accumulated inside the samples. So like here, this is a 200x. If I further goes down the, the smaller area and enlarge it, you can see, you can still get all the pore information here. So how the pores and H pores inside this structure, pore distribution, so those things you can able to calculate the gate in the microscopy images. So you can go further magnify uh, this, this small area, then you can able to get, you can see that the particular area there is a particular growth type board like structure that you are getting inside this post. So if you go further magnifying this image in step by step, you can get you know, more information. Like this, this particular area, if I further magnify, I will get you know better image you can see here. So what, how the pores is, is developed, so those structure is clearly visible at 16,000 um, magnification. So by changing this magnification, you are able to get you know, more and more better internal features in case of SCM microscope. You can see here, it's a 45,000 K, you can get, you know, how the, 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 how the structure is more further porous or dense, or those information can able to get by using SCM microscope. So, so in SCM, you can use, you can get a topography image, you can get internal structure features, uh, or of little depth, and you can able to get also, you know, how the shape and the size of the particles. If you see the two types that I discussed, scanning that uh, secondary electron and base electron, both can be used in these SCM images. You can see how this this uh, can be useful. In first image here, you see secondary electron, you can see you are able to getting the structure uh, of the, the fiber like structure here. And that fiber is more prominent if you go for a you know backscattered image. 
to mostly you can see to the vector you know that particular uh, features which enhance but you have a bacteria image on right hand side you can see if a combination of base scatter and second electron the right side is only base scatter electron image you can see the bacteria in case of phi the common use combination of base scatter and second electron you can able to see the better structure where you have only base scatter but you are getting say you know it's a rough structure where this you are not able to see the perfect nature of the bacteria structure of the bacteria so mainly base scatter electron that are high energy is mostly used for compositional contrast and brightness of the region in the image increases with the atomic number if a high jet material so um, your vector electron in some way that that will be the region will be more um, brightness so in second electron it's mainly a low energy so you can use only for you know topographic the contrast you can use for topographic image imaging and it's a high resolution and you have a fluorescent x ray that produced in this piston during in this electron interaction you can also get fluorescent and that used for you know composition analysis Like energy dispersive mapping, that energy dispersive spectroscopy. If you see, so that we here will get depending upon the this is a mineral crust sample. So here you can see that silicon is present, and then the phosphorus is present, the iron is present, this calcium is present. So all these elemental analysis you can able to see by using you know scanning electron microscope. Even that the needs facility of the scanning electron microscope here. During this process of generation of secondary electron, so vacancy is created. Once um, once the electron falls the sample, the second the electron you know second secondary electron is generated. So once second electron come out, so it's a vacancy is created. To fill that vacancy, the higher orbital that the electron come in, inside and producing X-ray photons, and that X-ray process X-ray is detected here in case of spectral mapping. It has a particular for each element has a particular fingerprint X-ray like copper. You can get copper K alpha or iron and iron K alpha or K F P K beta. So those information will give you the compositional structure and it determine the amount of elements at present atomic level that up to point one percent detection limit can able to see. And you can also scan whether a particular in a if you have a sample on the sample you can scan a particular point you can scan in a line across the line how the intensity is varied or in the whole area how did the composition those things you can often you can see this in amend of ZNO samples in a spherical particles you can see here in a same image and then when you go for MN K alpha the index analysis you can see how the magnetism are distributed this the red dots indicating how the magnetism distributed on the Whole screen. some samples on the whole screen. Other so the sample you can see the right side the cobalt of ZNO. You can see how the cobalt is distributed. So that indicating that the manganese and cobalt is uniformly distributed throughout the matrix and throughout the sample. If it is not uniformly distributed, so instead of this continuous dot, you will get somewhere like this type of aggregate and somewhere it is absent. So that will really show you have a clustering effect in the sample that is not uniformly distributed. So to get that, when we are dopant, we are doping the material. We are able to get uh, the dopant is uniformly distributed, uh, or it is the you know, random aggregate form. Those type of structure you can able to get in the SCM. But if you have a biological sample, then the SCM or the energy used at thirty kV or something, that energy from the biological sample can damage. So you can't use those biological sample directly for the SCM analysis. For that. You have to use a environmental SCM that is a more advanced version of SCM, which use for you know if those are biological sample, as well as insulating sample where you can't uh, that charging effect is there. So there you can use those type of this because these are vacuum sensitive. So you can low vacuum can able to get that in the scanning that that's it's the environmental SCM. You can see the biological sample, the organic films, or even the wet sample is can able to see in case of environmental SCM. Principle is same. Only thing is here you have a um, its chamber is a, such a way that it maintain that you know provide the condition for the low vacuum. At that particular low vacuum, can able to get uh, the better information of biological sample. So it used to the image of chemical and physical processes in situ, like how the mechanical stress oxidation of metal occurs. So those information where once you are metal oxidized, your surface will change. So you can see those in situ um, other kind of hydration. A dehydration process; those things can be able to see. You can see the SCM. The pressure is quite low, 0.08 to 0.30, 0.30 torr. And various gases can be used here. That nitrogen environment mostly is kept. 
to maintain that you know and provide environmental condition here and uh, mainly that that SCM will give you a topographic uh, feature. Mainly it will give you, you know, a topographic configuration information about the sample uh, where you can able to see both morphology as well as that is shape and size and compositional as well as the dark specialty or even you will be able to get uh, you know a crystallographic information where they are using FP SEM and that is field emission from my machine or shining electron microscope. So with the SCM that I have discussed mainly deals with the scanning properties that you have a raster scan that will scan you can see the electron that the uh, material characteristics. So if you have any question on SCM you can discuss this here uh, for one or two minutes and then we'll go to the transmission electron microscope part. So if any question then you can raise in the chat box. Especially on SCM. Chat box majority of here. Start. So if there is no question on scanning electron microscope, so we'll go to now uh, transmission electron microscope. So here Yes, there we use a backscatter electron as well as secondary electrons. But in case of transmitted electron microscope, we mainly deal with transmitted electrons. So if you come into the history of uh, the, the historical background of TEM, so TEM is a e that is more mostly the 1931. It started, you know, first uh, the Dr. Ernest Raska, uh, the University of Berlin, and Max Null combinedly did first electron microscope. In 1931, that is at about magnification of 400x only. So, but right now the magnification can go to you know lakhs, um, um, five lakhs x. You can also go, but the first microscope was you know 400x. So they got Nobel Prize in 1986 for this discovery. So TM is mainly a unique tool to characterize crystal structure and microstructure simultaneously by diffraction and imaging. In the earlier case, that we mainly use imaging technique. SEM was mainly imaging, and then part of the fluorescence is coming, extra fluorescence, your compositional analysis. But here, we have a combination of imaging as well as diffraction. Both is used. So diffraction, you can use them to get crystal information or it is that imaging part that microscopic structure, shape, size, morphology, those things you can able to see. So Simon then mm, developed the first commercial SCM in 1939. And then on that all modern electron microscope, as I told, the resolution is 2 million times that whatever that first electron microscope Raska has developed. So even at 100 kV, that uh, energy, we have a lambda is 0 0.0039 nanometer. And see, such very small lambda. It is more than sufficiently small to image action. You can able to get atomic information because of this very, very low lambda. And, you know, lens information that is that, that limits in this case, earlier version, old my SC, the cunning electron microscope, you have a lot of uh, abrasion, correction, or chromatic abrasion occur. So those type of abrasion now with the newer version of the TM, so those of the lens imperfection can be, you know, rectified, has been rectified, and you get very high resolution image in case of, you know, uh, transmission electron microscope. In case of transmission, you can see, even the EOA sample, that, uh, that on, the, on the copper grid where you are putting the samples or uh, those are more less than 100 nanometer uh, thickness. So it's small, th quite uh, thin uh, cross section, you can see your sample, and then when X incident beam fall, it's transmitted through the, you know, in the sample. And you can get three type of beam. One will be directed beam, that is, that is directly transmitted, and other two as one is elastically scattering, and another inelastic scattering. So that the inelastic scattering we use for, you know, how much energy is lost. So that is used for, you know, that is yield spectroscopy that I will discuss, you know, electron energy loss spectroscopy, but as a direct and elastic scattered beam produce image to con image contrast with depending on the thickness or mass of the sample 
then we also will get diffraction pattern. And whatever the X-ray produced here during this process, uh, that you can all we can also generate X-rays. So that X-ray is huge as a mapping similar to ACM EDAX mapping. You can do TM EDAX mapping to get the composition analysis. So whatever you are getting in SCM, you get more better information at smaller uh, size and high resolution. In addition, you will get you know diffraction pattern. You can get you know crystallographic information. If you see, this is the, in the, the modern days uh, microscope. In that microscope top, uh, we have an electron crown here. Then different lenses are there inside this. And then we have a objective up with this condenser aperture, objective aperture. And then you here you have to keep the sample between the, the, this space. And then different intermediate aperture. And finally, you have a fluorescent screen on that you will be able to see the image. And you have a detector here. So that is in the side, you have a detector uh, in the, this side. So that detector will help you to calculate where the K alpha is coming. So that will be detected by the detector to be able to see the composition analysis. You can see here, you have an electron gone here. Here again, the tungsten or lab 6 is generally huge as the source of the uh, electron gone, electron. So if you have lab 6, you can go, you know, you're able to high, you know, that intensity is quite high as compared to tungsten. Then you have a condenser lens, different, you can see different set of magnetic lenses are here, one, two, three lenses are from here. And then you have aperture through which it falls and finally it comes to the sample surface here. Uh, then it transmitted the X-ray beam, so the transmission electron beam is coming through the different, you know, intermediate lenses, and finally you will be able to see on a, you know, fluorescent screen, or you have a camera at the bottom, or a CCD charge couple detector, where you'll get that image in this case. So here, if you see the whole uh, TM ray diagram, that you have electron source, condenser lenses, objective lenses, as well as projector lenses, and you have a fluorescent screen, which are the more mainly four component of that uh, scanning uh, transmission electron microscope. And here I told that two possibilities is there. One is imaging mode, one is diffraction mode. In imaging mode, you can see from the electron gone that how the electron beam is coming, and finally, you are know, falling on the sample, and then, uh, so you see that this is the sample here, and then, uh, then it's going through the different aperture, and you are getting the image at the image here. But in the diffraction mode, you are inserting a um, intermediate, you can uh, select an aperture, you are inserting, this. you can see here, this, uh, this objective, that aperture here, objective aperture is here in back focal plane. plane. So, in, but this is, uh, that image, in the image plane, you have a, that, uh, you know, that selected area aperture is here, so that aperture, you know, again it forms, in the, the electron beam will be attracted and finally through the lens and finally you get a spots that diffraction pattern here. The whole area you are able to get that image here, but here you can get a spot pattern, you will be able to get, you know, diffraction image. So difference between the two modes only with the strength of the intermediate lenses. So what are the intermediate lenses here you use? This is the intermediate lenses here, objective aperture here, and here you can see the intermediate objective aperture here. So that strength is different, you know, of the you know, different order. So that helps to, you know, whether you are going for an image or you are getting for a diffraction beam. For a diffraction, in case of diffraction beam, as I discussed in X-ray diffraction, you can see here that whenever that Brax law satisfied, and you will get a you know, similar the electron diffraction here, the incident beam is coming here, then uh, this black line is incident beam, it falling on the sample surface, you have a lattice plane here, and it is diffraction either particular two theta, you will able to get in a spot where you can see that the red plane and a green, green plane is here, and the two lattice plane I have shown here, the incident beam interact and you will get a diffraction spot. This is the center beam that the black one, the center beam, and then and you can see how that whenever the lattice plane of that green plane satisfied with the incoming, you know, matches with the, the uh, electron, uh, plus satisfied with the incoming electron, so you'll able to get that green dots. When you have a red plane satisfied, you'll able to get red plane. So you can able to get this type of uh, green dots on the, you know, on the screen. And this is the zero zero, the center one. That is the mainly direct beam that is here. So you'll able to get this type of spot. So you like like in most of the crystal, the polycrystal material, you have a different planes are there. You can see blue, green, red, black, and white and yellow planes are there. And so all these planes, so you will able to get a particular plane, you 
when it's when you have a multiple, that means multiple lattice plane you're able to see here. When you have a black one uh, plane, you have a blue, red, yellow one your plane. When that, but that um, same plane is also available in this case, also in this case, also in this case. So that's why you will you will get the black dot, black dot, red dot, blue dot all together, and they will try to merge, it and you will be able to get a you know dot that highly dotted plane in case of polycrystalline material. So here, since it's a multiple grains are there, so one one, for example, one zero zero plane is present in in each one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all these uh, grains as a one 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 zero zero plane, and that one that were one 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 plane, you can see here one one plane were getting multiple dots. So all together they can merge to get a ring type of patterns. So you can see here in case of Amar first. Since there is a discussion, there is no long range ordering is there. So it's a diffuse structure. So you can see there is no, you know, this crystalline plane, the lattice plane are not clearly visible, but you'll get you'll get a diffuse ring. This type of diffuse ring you will get in case of amorphous material. But when you'll go for a polycrystalline material, you can see here multiple uh, plane is coming here. And with, so you are able to get, you know, rings type of structure with bright con con contrast. So if a single crystal, you get only one plane you can see here, you have multiple planes you can able to see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight planes and nine planes are here. But here you can see only all are in only one plane. So in this case, you will get only dots, square dots are available here. So polyclate crystalline material made up of many tiny single, single crystals, you can say that's why you get a ring patterns in case of polycrystal material, but in case of armor, first you get diffuse ring, for a single crystal you get dotted patterns. So this electron diffraction is mainly produced similar to that of, you know, Euler's dual sphere I discussed in case of like extra diffraction here. So wherever the reciprocal is, you can see that you have a, this incident beam is uh, coming here. You have a incident beam is here, incident beam then it's diffracted like this. So it's coming the theta angle is this is this angle is theta here. So then what happened that one by lambda that what are the wavelength that one by lambda the radius of the sphere. So wherever that point, if the, this particular point is satisfied, if a P point satisfied that uh, fall on this reciprocal like this UL sphere, then you will get uh, the particular dots. That wherever that uh, on this radius on the on the curve surface on this circle the one forever you get a particular point like you can you will be able to get that planes like you have a, I have a sonar plane here in, in this plane you can see this point O point is matching here that's why they're able to get that particular plane in this case so in here the only difference is here you can see that the sine theta is equal to 2d line lambda equal to d sine theta that if sine theta is lambda by 2d here you can see here that if you see this equation that electron beam is this, this is the sample that uh, here on the sun that sample you have a um, electron beam is falling and what happened here this angle in, in case of here the Bragg's angle 2 theta is very very small like it's less than 1 to 2 degree for example XRD XRD effect is quite high up you can go up to 140 160 but it's a like the here 2 theta is less than more very more it's is less than uh, one to two degree. So such a, a low value of two theta that you can see that the lambda equal to two d uh, sine theta. So that equation will be changed. Will be lambda equal to two d theta. D sine theta will be almost equivalent to d theta. So uh, lambda equal to two d in case of p m. Um, lambda equal to two d theta. And if you consider this, this this is the R that is the photographic film. But you get this is the R and this length from the sample to the photographic film is L. The screen distance this is the radius of the ring that will get, which is 2 theta is R by L simply. Since this is sine theta term will be neglected. So this will be R by L um, you will get that's 2 theta. So then 2 theta R that you, 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 you consider this two equation you will get RD equal to L lambda. So this RD equal to L lambda is the main equation that using this you can identify difference electron pattern. So that I'll discuss how you identify this uh, uh, this equation that uh, Rd equal to L lambda. This equation Rd, Rd equal to L lambda. L is the camera constant that is constant for each, you know, uh, that 
DMs, whatever the photograph film you are taking, so that there is a constant position, a particular distance you will take to the L, you will get directly a lambda, you know, in case of TM, if you are using 100 kV or 200 kV, the particular lambda you will use. And R is the ring structure. You can see this is the this is the ring you are getting here, another ring is here. So these rings you are getting the radius from the center to this with the R is the radius. So you have to measure this R. If this equation is generally in older version, that uh, R is expressed in terms of you know where you have to measure the distance and this distance, then what you, you have to use that R value and you'll able to all the all other parameters you know, you will able to get the D value. In here, since this this you can see here this axis, the scale is five upon one by nanometer, so it's a reciprocal one by nanometer is given. So if the image is taken reciprocal like this. Reciprocal image, so you can directly image from here to this, from this bright point to this bright point. You can take and divide by two, you get that you know, R value. So just one by R you have to calculate. So that you will get D. You have to have a directly, you have a lambda one by nanometer scale is provided in your electron diffraction pattern. But if it is in 10 nanometer, only nanometer, or for two nanometer scale, instead of nanometer inverse in nanometer, then you have to use this particular equation you have to use to get that uh, you know, um, particular thing. Like this D value you get from this equation, then you can with the JCPD data, you can MIMA, you can calculate for which D value that particular plane is coming by using this equation, you can able to get you know, each D species of this element. So, but in case of um, this, this way, in case of polycrystal metal, able to get in this way, but if a single crystal, you'll get these spots. So these spots you have to calculate at one to one. The center one you have to consider as a zero zero plane in this case. And then if the G1 factor is G2 factor, and this one will be summation of G1 plus G2. If it is one one, one bar one zero, a zero two zero plane, then it will be one bar in one plus two three in zero plane. So you have to measure the distance of the diffracted spot from the central spot, this is the diffracted spot, and this is the central spot, you have to measure this distance. And then you have to, accordingly, you have to, the closest point like H1, K1, L1, H2, K2, L2 are the angle between them, this angle you have to see. And then if you know uh, the index of the closest set of diffraction spots, it is possible to index them. If you are able to index these two planes, then it will be able to possible to higher order uh, this, or you can be next plane, you can calculate by just a summation of GH scale is equal to G1 plus G2. Each diffraction spot can be reached by combination of these two vectors, you will able to get all the, you know, pattern you can identify. But if an amorphous structure, there you will get a diffuse ring. So that diffuse ring, to get information, you have to get a radial distribution function. So now it has more come the advanced fluctuation microscope, that available nowadays, TM fluctuation, TM microscopy, where that you can get this intensity has to be, you know, converted to radial distribution function, and that radial distribution you can get this type of spectra. So with that, you can able to calculate that different information about that R value, what is that um, interactive distance, or those information you can able to get in case of amorphous pattern. So, so far what I have discussed is mainly I discuss with uh, with, elect, with the dead, with the diffraction pattern. So about the diffraction pattern of the uh, PM microscopy. So mainly the diffraction will give you, you know, the lattice structure that particular whether it is that uh, which plane is oriented to the electron beam, and you can able to even analyze the particular phase is formed. Example that to one I have shown here. This is a F three O four diffraction pattern. You can able to identify each. Mm, you can able to identify each plane, and we will have, you can then final structure, crystal structure. You can determine. But if you coming into the now that the electron the PM imaging part that will produce mainly image. Which is you can get the information about the shape, size, and as well as the surface. You know, that uh, the structure, 3D or 2D structure of the material. So image of a specimen is formed selectively by allowing two types of beam, like one is transmitted beam, another is, you know, diffracted beam. Like if you have a, a sample surface here, after interacting the electron beam, so what will happen that um, 
one with a direct image to you can passing through the sample another is since you have a multiple lenses are there so this direct beam is come another one this beam which is coming here they can be you know slightly diffracted so this type of diffracted beam like the tilted beam those those beam can be used so in, in here mainly two types of you know one is bright field one is dark field image is produced in case of pm imaging the image form of a specimen is selectively allowing only transmitted beams that will be bright field or diffracted beam that will be dark field dark field down to the you know microscope you can see here that this is the electron beam is coming here and falling on the different lenses and finally here is the specimen and this is the specimen here so after this specimen is falling you can see some of the beam is going like this and some of the beam is falling like this so the the beam which directly goes is called a directed beam and that beam which is diffracted is to go to the diffraction image and is diffracted uh, we need to collect then we'll be able to get that you know dark field image the origin of the image contrast is the variation of the intensity of the transmitted beam due to the differences in diffraction condition depending on the microstructural feature like in the particular material the dense or it is a you know, low z material or high z material depending upon that the intensity of the transmitted you know electron beam is very so that will be give you, you know contrast in the image that we discuss so mainly in case of imaging you have a mass thickness contrast like if you have a thin film sample or we have more of have some of the material like you have a um, core cell material core is like for example low z material for example is a Uh, and the cell is a high jet material like the, you can take the opposite way like silica coated on a zinc oxide particle zinc oxide is high zinc is high jet but soft surface silica is low jet so there is a mass, mass thickness uh, you know con variation is here so jet constant imaging that will give high resolution image or you can also go for a diffraction con contrast Like a material, one material is highly crystalline, and other is just slightly amorphous. So you can able to get you know diffraction contrast image, or you can also high resolution image that has contrast image. You can also produce so both direct beam and indirect beam, diffracted beam, both will be considered and get a high resolution image. So these three type of image that we we'll discuss. So first coming into how the bright field image are formed. You can see here as I told, in case of bright field image, the direct beams. Are huge. You can see here. This is the incident beam is coming, falling on the lenses, and then this direct. This is the direct straight beam is coming here. You can see the here. So since this is this is this is the specimen on the this is the specimen on which that electron beam is fall, and then after interacting the electron beam, this is the direct beam is coming, and this is the diffracted beam is coming. So the direct beam is coming here. At A and B, that is going through the this hole uh, and is going so creating the image. That is the direct beam, so that will produce a bright field image in case of you know if you use the direct beam. But here you can see for the diffracted beam that is stopped by the you know here by an aperture. The the diffracted beam is not allowing here. Uh, to this, uh, this is the open space where the electron beam will passes through uh, that the, the objective aperture. And so it's only allowing the direct beam. You can see that the only that direct beam is coming at the center, and this is the just that uh, objective aperture is just above the direct beam. So you're able to get the image formed. This will get a bright field image. An object, the aperture is placed in the black from a focal plane. The objective lens, which allows only the transmitted beam, so that the direct beam transmitted, that will be allowed. You will get a you know bright this bright field image. But in case of dark field image, you can see here that that whatever the uh, you see here that the direct beam is coming here after interacting the sample. Those are you know getting stopped with the objective. You change the objective aperture position so that diffracted beam, these two diffracted beam, they are crossing. This objective aperture, and you are getting an image. You can see that bright field here. The center beam is stopped, and you are considering a side diffracted beam. So one or more diffracted electron beams are allowed to pass the objective aperture placed back focal planes of the objective lens, while transmitted beam is completely blocked 
here the transmitted beam that is directly coming so that is completely stopped when you are getting the indirect beam and you are able to get that diffracted beam which produce the image that you will get a dark field image so in case of dark field image there is two possibilities again that since you, since you are using diffracted beam so you can keep that the sample in such a way that if your direct the beam is perpendicularly falling here on the sample surface and then you can see the direct beam is stopped here and in diffracted beam whatever you are getting so the diffracted beam coming and forming an image you are getting here that uh, dark field image so here whatever is uh, the incident beam uh, this is directly falling on the sample but in other way in the center dark field you can see that the here that the electron beam is not coming directly from the top it slightly have tilted the angle of incident of the electron beam and then what happened the direct beam is going like go like this and that is stopped here and the diffracted beam you can see is the after diffraction is falling uh, straight and coming here so this is called center dark field image on axis dark field you can see and this is off axis dark field so it is not on the if this is the axis main axis so this will be off axis this 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 one here and here it is on axis here so two types of dark field image you will able to get in case of you know dark field image if you see this mask the thickness contrast image you can see here you have a sample surface see this is a low z material you can see it lies in gray color and it's a high z material is black color i have shown so z is quite high that atomic number is quite high in that case you can see in in case of high z material you can see how the um, this electron beams are coming and accordingly you are getting a in, in intensity based that the z contrast based image on the bottom screen so mainly contrast as a function of z in case of mass thickness contrast and more scattering at high z material since so high z material you are getting higher scattering in this case and your transmission will be less and the accordingly the image will be created in that portion and here the transmission is be high and scattering will be less you will get you know depending on the mass thickness you will able to get this side of image you can see that is mainly used to measure the thickness that uh, is thickness you can also able to see in a thin sheet that can measure more scattering the higher than higher thickness material so that you can calculate the thickness also and it's important for armor for characteristic for biological sample that you know the contrast variation can be used you can see this is f3 o4 coated with silica you can see this black dot is f3 o4 on the surface you have a silica you can see silica is less dense or is for this iron oxide is you know completely dense you know, because of high z material electron transmission is less in this case you are getting a you know, more dark spot here at the outer side you are getting a lighter spot because of the low z material so this type of core cell structure you, know, you can able to identify by using tn if you have a contrast variation between the core and cell like here fe fe uh, center fe and outside silica the z is quite difference because of fe is 26 atomic number and silica is some 14 so there is you know completely you know uh, large variation in the z so you can able to see this type of contrast image so in case of if you see the how the bright field and dark field give this was a bright field image that you are getting here in case of you can see this is a bright field image that you can get get mostly in case of bright field image you will get that you know this darker image you will a gray image you will get in case of bright field image you can see how these particles are you are able to see that you can see here it is more darker it is less darker because here multiple particles a assembled structure where the center you know multiple particles are arranged to get this type of you know, say zinc oxide assembly structure so because of that some darker portion you are able to see at the center where the surrounding field is lighter image but if you go for the um, dark field image you can see this is the big image that is the dark field image here you can see that bright spots are observed in dark field wherever the grains are there so there you will get you know bright uh, bright spot in dark field image you will get bright spot here so the, that is showing it is a whole structure in the structure how the grains are in present but those individual grains are you can able to see so here 
to see whether this, this, this structure is, whether they assemble the particle or a single particle to analyze that, the dark field image was performed, you can see each dots are separated. So that indicating this a multiple, you know, nanocrystals come together to form an assembled structure uh, up to about 200 nanometer and each particular weight to 30 nanometer in the range. So those type of assembled structure can be analyzed by using, you know, this type of dark field image uh, where you'll able to see the grains each present. In case of PM, also you can conjugate, you know, scanning transmission electron microscope. We have a combined with a raster scanner here in addition to the, you know, normal TM, that's like SCM, we have a raster scanner. So that raster scanner, you can combine with this TM, you will get scanning transmission electron microscope, STEM. And here we have a raster is here and that raster will be scanned across the sample. You can able to see how the, you can see the SEM EM image here and STM image here. You can see inside that feature is clearly more clearly visible. You have a raster scanner in this. Image. So here you can do simultaneous EDS analysis, in analysis, as well as you can get a better image contrast and then that uh, normal PM case. So, in addition to uh, this you know, imaging, diffraction, as well as, you know, uh, raster scanner in the case of uh, scanning transmission electron microscope, you can also use, you can able to identify the composition of the element by using a EDAC facility like SCM. So, you have a detector there, so that detector will detect what are the K alpha or L alpha is coming from the sample and then to identify the composition. You can see this is a cobalt dot zinc oxide sample where G cobalt is less than 5% is dropped on a zinc oxide sample. You have, you have scanned that spectral scan against the line scan I told that spectral scan on EDAC is going to be done on a spot on whole sample. Whole sample you can do whole this whole sample or you can do a particular spot or you can do a line scan. So this image was done at a line scan. You can see here, you are getting the signal of copper, zinc, uh, copper is coming from the copper grid that is mainly what used for TN, but it's a zinc and cobalt, you are getting to see cobalt and this zinc you are getting. So you can see if you would, along the line you measure and then you will see how your, you know, con your intensity is varying, the counts is varying. So that will give whether uniformly distributed or non-uniformly. Like you have a spherical particle, on the spherical particle from one end to other end it will go. What will happen the surface, uh, from the surface you will see the less number of, uh, you know, uh, K alpha will go the center, then the thickness is increasing. So the center you will get more you know, large number of K alpha. So because of that, if a highly hemispherical structure you will get, so that will indicate that copper is uniformly that. Cobalt is uniformly distributed. So those type of, you know, um, composition analysis you can get. You can also get individual concentration of uh, how much co cobalt is there and how much zinc is there. You can see here, this is a, a copper K alpha spectral mapping. In addition to the composition, you can see these red dots are here, mainly coming from ZN K alpha, whereas green dots are this is how the DC FP is here. This is FP3O4 ZNO nanocomposite is here. In the whole sample, you have a FP3 ZNO in that FP3O4 is inside the embedded. So those FP3O4, you can see these green dots are there. So how this zinc and FP3O4 are distributed, you can see in case of zinc, it is uniformly you can able to see for FP3O4 you cannot see a hemispherical sphere, it's a, somewhere it speaks it there, and it, that means that FE304, here you can see it's a cluster-like thing, here less distributed. So those type of information, that whether aggregated or in a distributed uniform, so those things you know, by using the K alpha or K beta spectral mapping, you can able to identify this type of um, compositional structures. But if you have a core cell structure that is having same Z material, so in that case, it is not possible, like by seeing by just, just by normal TM analysis, like silica, which is the FE304 coated by silica or silicon oxide. So there, could you contrast difference, you are able to see those core and cell structure. But if a same jet material, so then you are not able to see. So here you can see you have taken cobalt and nickel, CO, Ni, a core cell structure. Here it is difficult to see in jet scanning based on contrast. So that's why if you do electron mapping, that K alpha in X-ray mapping here, so you can see 
that this is the is yellow is that C O N I L O that you can see how this green red dots and how this green dots is mainly red dots. It's which one is a platinum. This one is palladium platinum coat cell structure. So this green color is red color is mainly P D and P T. You can see overlap image how this P D P T is distributed. In the right image the cobalt nickel is coat cell structure to alloy formation. You can see. Initially, it is a coat cell structure, a coat nickel is here, and cobalt is here. And then you go on, go on hitting to 25 degree to 600 degree centigrade, and slowly you are getting an alloy system uniformly distributed here. You can see the electron mapping, you can see here, here the transmission electron mapping, in this case, the elemental mapping. So here you can see that how this initially the nickel and cobalt, nickel is green and cobalt is red. This core cell structure is clearly visible. Center is green dot and outside cobalt dot. When you 600, you can see these dots are mixed together. You are getting some sort of yellow dots. So green and red overlap each other. You are getting the red dots that indicating you can be able to get a you know LI system is formed here. So those type of similar jet material you can analyze by using this type of you know core cell structure. Uh, by by use of similar jet material by electron mapping, you can able to get that structure. So uh, in addition to that, you can also get another thing: electron energy loss spectroscopy. That uh, that I told when that electron beam is coming to the sample, it's interacting and some, some, some are directly transmitted. So those after interacting, so when they are passing, so they lost some energy. So because of that, uh, what are the energy loss? So that can be loss energy can be measured. And you can be able to produce a spectra that is called electron energy loss spectroscopy, which is similar to you know that X-ray absorption exact study that I discussed in that X-ray absorption fine spectra spectroscopy. In case of X-ray here, electron energy loss spectroscopy that yields is the exogenous and that the that the extended um, energy loss near edge structure and extended energy loss structure that is exact is replaced by your electron exiles so those type of feature you can able to get also in case of yield spectra and you can see that the multiple peak here this one is zero loss that means the electrons that have not lost energy after you know going through the sample the loss distribution low loss distribution means that they interact weekly about 100 eV electron volt that they interacted with weakly bound electron but the loosely bound electron with that interact you can get a background of that this low loss energy and in the core loss region the electrons that have interacted with tightly bound core electron you will get this type of you know highly plasma peak or highly intense peak you will be able to get. So mainly two types of peak that near edge structure you will be able to get another is extended structure. With the near edge structure that you will be able to get that coordinate that um, oxidation state, relative band structure or extended fine structure you will be able to get you know that uh, the coordination numbers and uh, how symmetry of the material the, this coordination symmetry those information we you can get. So I'll not discuss more detail about LNS and XJF. I have discussed it. Uh, in case of X-ray, I have discussed in more detail. So mostly it is similar to that XJF um, this properties. So um, you can see this, uh, this is a yield spectra. You can use the titanium oxide. You can see two peaks that you are getting. So you can see that the titanium is plus three state, plus four test. Those information like you can able to get even from the energy loss that uh, valency band structure you can get, you can able to get composition analysis for chemical bonding states. And then you can, you can also produce image by electron energy loss spectroscopy. You can see that uh, how this uh, backscatter electron and this different type of this bright field image, as well as you know, this uh, electric EFT and the delay electron energy uh, loss TM, there you can filter with the electron field this energy that we call it. Mm -hmm. What do you call it? Is electron? All this, yeah. Ooh. This is electron. The yeah, electron energy uh, loss spectroscopy that will get, and you can see, you can able to get uh, those uh, structural image as well as you can also you can do scanning TM 
uh, electron energy loss uh, mapping when able to see here titan is red aluminum is green and you can able to see this is blue is the oxygen and you can the whole structure you can go and get a you know electron mini mapping by depending upon the you know the titanium aluminum oxygen composition so those type of information you can also get from the pm in addition to that like i go i told you both the dark field and bright field both is possible in this case one dark dark you know, bright field you use you know direct beam whereas uh, this dark field you use diffracted beam for the imaging but if you combine both of them both direct beam as well as uh, diffracted beam if you both take you will get high resolution image that produced because of the you know in, in, in that phase interaction interference pattern that generated from the both dark and bright field you can see this is the incident electron waves and it is a sample surface after interacting you have a both trans transmitted beam and diffracted beam both if you consider you will get you know this one see here that they are in phase here so they are in phase here um, um, they are not in phase in this case so there in here the phase depend the transmitted beam and diffracted will each have a different phase and their result the interference is occurs because the directed guided beam and transmitted beam where the interference will occur there is coherent the interference but you can able to get a hrtm that is called phase contrast image you can see here here in the that is this is the sample from the sample that beam is transmitting and here you can see this is the diffracted beam is here and the, 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 here is the, this is the direct beam that is coming through the sample and this is a diffracted beam you can see it going through a particular angle to the diffracted beam so both di diffracted and transmit this is diffracted this is diffracted where is this one is direct beam so both diffracted and direct beam is coming through the objective uh, aperture and you are getting your large scanning area you are getting so you will able to get because of the interference you will able to get a image is formed that is quite high resolution so the dark field will give you atomic plane information or bright field will give you fins construct made up of both bright and dark field so that will interfere and you will able to get you know depending upon the operating condition you will able to get you know thickness if you properly focus material and then you can get at how this you know atomic scale material you can able to see that atomic structure those information you can able to see by using both direct and diffracted beam you can see this is a zinc oxide sample this a with manganese doping you can see you can able to see all this line this lines are nothing but you know lattice ranges of a particular plane 0001 plane of getting zinc oxide if you go further high resolution you can able to see how these different grains are connected to each other or you can see how the this white each white dots are atoms this is the line you are able to see in this case this line and that line in that line you can able to see that how the atoms are arranged in hexagonal pattern in case of this so this type of high resolution tm you can get lattice parameter you can able to but between these two plane the distance you measure and then that distance will be the lattice spacing and you can identify that particular plane that this distance is here between these two line so when you go for line you have to you either you have to consider the in between in the this line directly on the uh, atomic plane or you can take in between that black line the, so you can able to get that spacing that will indicate particular plane is there if you go for further analysis of this uh, more higher resolution you can see here this is a three grain i have shown one two and this is the overlapping region of the two grains so you can see that is the two grain is there uh, you can see this this is one line is coming here the fringes and then at particular you can see here it is bifurcated here so those type of dislocation defects you can see this is this line is going this line is going like this this line is going in like this spectra and here here you can see this is bifurcated so that means here some dislocation is occur so those type of dislocation defects can be analyzed by using pm microstructure if you go further you can have high resolution atomic scale you can see the stack can also see the defect like stacking faults you can see in this up to here you can see the atoms are perfectly aligned in this case but when you go there you can see the position is that the dotted line is deviating the atomic position is deviating from the dotted line so that is showing lots of you can see here how this this is instead of going straight they going 
if they go like slightly, you know, different path. So that is this you can see they are not straight. So that indicating that there are lots of stacking fault in the system. So those type of you know stacking fault information you can able to get in this case. But if a biological sample like environmental SEM, here we have a cryo TM. You can able to get the information about biological virus. This is a virus structure. You can see this is a liposome, these are soft material. So what happened is biological material, when high energy, 200 keV or 300 keV TM will be exposed, they will bond. So they will just bond out and able to see the, those structure. So through this structure, you have to go for your fish, the sample at very low temperature using methane, liquid methane, or using, you know, with liquid nitrogen, and you have to feed the structure, and then you will be able to see the bilayer structure. You can see the bilayer structure of the lipogen or a virus structure you can see using the cryotm. So, in case of this uh, cryo imaging, so I'll take another 10 minutes uh, to complete the today's class. So, in addition, but in case of this, all this microscope will go for SC, TM, SCM. Uh, or you go high resolution micros TM. So there are some lenses, uh, there is uh, this error because, because of the you know, lenses. So there are some uh, lots of you know, abrasion errors, spherical uh, lens abrasion is there. So that will, continue, will not get the perfect image. For example, one is spherical abrasion, like instead of all image, that focal point is getting in a particular focal point, they can be meet at different points. You will get that, you know, electron trajectory it changes. Or you have a, you know, like a test here of a particular point, you will get a focal length type structure, a diffraction pattern type structure, and you will all transmit it, it will not fall in the particular point. So you have to be, all has to make in a single point to get a better on image, high resolution image, and corrected image. So or, the, or you have a um, this chromatic correction instead of meeting the same line that uh, electron beam of different energy, so they can be focused at a different point. So this type of all this or astigmatism that you have a focal plane like uh, from this plane, this plane, focal plane, tangent focal plane or a sagittal focal plane, you have a different point they meet. So then you will able to get, you know, different errors in the, in the electron, that microscopy imaging. So all these things have been nowadays taken care of by using, you know, modern day uh, lens correction, different types of corrections there. You can overcome those and you will get a better image. So but the most important thing for the TM is sample preparation. If you can prepare a better sample, you will get your, you know, your PM, you, you know, it's time consuming, as you said, it's highly costly uh, equipment, and then you have to pay quite large for the PM analysis. For that, you have to train on sample operation, that the prime objective for TM analysis. If your sample operation is not good, then you will not able to get anything on the TM uh, that screen. If, for example, if it's a nanoparticle, you will end it with some aggregates structure instead of individual nanoparticle. So you're not able to see. So for that, sampling is the prime importance. If you if you want to see a metallurgical sample, like if you put a steel or some, uh, if you want to see some nitration in case of your carburization, in case of steel sample. So those type of thing has been prepared by you know from from a ball sample. You have to cut down a small mechanical lap thick and thick, and then you use further thinning, and then you have to ultrasonic thinning. You will get a you know very thick thin sample you will get and then with you have to manually you know you have to uh, dipping with the uh, cut um, top surface and you will end it with a very thin cross section here and that iron milling you will get this cross section and then you go and see for the tm this thing in case of steel sample uh, you can able to see the grind to first you have to cut from two five kilometer thick um, sample piece you have to three mm dicks you have to cut and three mm dicks to grind to 100 micromillimeter and grind then dimple to 10 to 20 micro and you buy up so then by iron milling whatever you get that sample will stay the sample you will go and see the TM analysis but if you have to see the cross this is for the topographic that for plan view if you want to go to cross section image whatever to do you have to cleave this type of you know Mm, this spherical and cylindrical shape you have to cut and then you have to cross sect multiple layer here and then you will get a thin cross section and that cross section have to iron mill to get a less than 10 micrometer uh, 0.1 less than 10 micrometer thin and then you will able to see that structure so mainly you have to stack the material in different layer 
you can see here is the by the glue these together the stag and by diamond so you have to cross check and then polish and then you mount your copper grid to see that structure so the, those are mainly you know uh, the steel sample or alloy sample that can be metallurgical sample that can be three by from bulk you have to cross section you get a less than uh, 10 micrometer or less than very thin uh, cross section and then that can be put on a tm grid to see the structure but in case of nanoparticle or biological sample, so what you have to do, you can't use directly powder sample as you use in case of um, this uh, SCM because here the vacuum is, you know, 10 to the power minus 8 order to 9 to order. So at high vacuum, those powder can be, you know, attracted, that means peel off from the sample, from the grid, that it can, you know, deposit on the lens, what will happen, that it will damage to the lens or it will be, you know, create a lot of, you know, problem in your analysis. So for that, what you have to do, you have to disperse your sample in a suitable solvent. Mostly we use methanol and ethanol, or you can use also water, but ethanol is much better because it's evaporate more easily so that you can get that the index inside the vacuum chamber, that the vacuum can be achieved, you know, in a less, lesser time if you have a solvent like ethanol in use. Then you disperse properly by sonication more than 15 minutes or to half an hour or even beyond, depending upon your sample dispersion. You make a proper dispersion then, and that dispersion on the TM grid, you drop cast that if you have a TM grid, if you see, this is a TM grid on that, you have a, this type of meshes are there, this type of boxes, meshes will be there. If it's 200 grid TM, then there will be 200 meshes. If it's 300 grid, then you have a 200, 300 boxes will be there. And on these boxes, you have a thin layer, you know, carbon coating will be there, conducting, because of providing conducting layer, the carbon coating will be there. On that carbon, you have to drop cast your sample. Your sample will go and stick on this um, space. So then you go and image with the uh, this. When you drop cast, you don't like uh, pour, don't pour multiple drops. Just one or two drop is sufficient. Uh, you know, you just die not very highly concentrated. Also, you that little dilute concentrate put, and then you can see the image you get. You know perfectly well separated particles that you can get but if a biological sample you have to do a lot of you know staining process like you have you have to go for initially like you have to by ultra micro to be like biological cross sample you have to first mount in a epoxy or a epoxy resin or acrylic resin and then you have to cut down the acrylic resin you get a cross thin cross section and then that cross section has to put uh, by the ultra microtomy you will get very thin cross section and then that can be put on the this you can see here this type of you can put on the tm slot grid and you are able to see the structure of that you know in case of biological samples we have to go for different staining like you have to if you have a some of the biological sample can also be done by negative contrasting that means you have to use like for example my cells vesicles they're soft templates so you can use a high jet material like lead acetate uranyl acetate you just put on that material what will happen and the wherever the sample is that vesicle is there or my cell on that surface what will happen on that size that my cell is uranyl acetate will be deposited and then when you see in the tm though your uh, biological sample will disintegrate the vesicle will completely burn out but it's uranyl acetate that will be present so that will create you know you know is a reflective image you can say you can able for the negative sampling you can able to get this type of structures uh, of the biological sample so other than this micro these two techniques you have also other microscope techniques like scanning probe microscopy when you use atomic force my fm atomic force microscopy so by tapping by or, or by contact you can able to get uh, you know you use a uh, tip on the tip will be scan uh, to contact more or in a tapping mode you continuously contact more or tapping more you can able to get the image of the material um, or you can use if electrostatic force microscopy, magnet, if a magnetic material, you can put the magnetic force or, the, or scanning tunneling microscope when you like this tip will be scanned, some electron tunneling will occur on the tip. So because that you can analyze and you're able to get different microscopic structure. So those details I will not I will discuss so mainly that these two uh, SCM and TM is widely used for that I have discussed these two. So the, the, all, in all these things, you have some resolution and you know, merits and demerits. So that like the, in case of this microscope resolution of the 
resolution is quite high, but at the same time, we can save of the scanning teeth and all these teeth and all these things, you know, that is not, uh, you know, uh, it can be broken down while scanning with a slow accurate image. So because of that, and so this technique, it's also widely used for scanning of the, you know, mainly used for topographic filling, that type of structure. So in from today's lecture, so the take home image is mainly we have, we have we have studied that two microscope, that one is scanning electron microscope, another is transmission electron microscope. So scanning electron microscope mainly gives news secondary electron and western electron, and it gives information about topography, uh, that how the surface structure, uh, the morphology, shape, and size, what is the composition, or the, main, the individual element present in the material. And it can also get a little bit about crystal wave information or that the biological sample you can use for, by using ECA, ECM to analyze the biological samples. But from SCN, you can get both diffraction as well as you know, imaging capability, or you combine both uh, direct beam and diffract beam to get high resolution image. So that's why you, why you can able to get atomic resolution imaging. You can also use DAX um, and IDAX facility so that element analysis, electron mapping, you can possible. And you can also find oxidation state information, the coordination number by using yield spectra, that what is the energy loss, electron energy loss spectroscopy from that. Or you can also determine the crystal structure, that electron diffraction pattern you are getting. You analyze the electron diffraction pattern using that equation that L lambda equal to uh, RD. So that uh, that uh, D you can find out so that can use for getting the structure information. You can also using that defects how the grain boundary that uh, dislocation stacking fault those things can be measured. You can see the grain boundary grain structure, and you can use the cryo electron facility cryo TM facility to get that biological sample analysis, or you can use the scanning TM microscopy to get that better information about the surface topography. So for the this. SCM is the sample preparation is not that uh, uh, difficult that you can just disperse your sample in a, a acetone and you drop cast on the brush top, or you can directly powder sample, you can put on a uh, copper in the carbon the, the, the carbon tape and you can see in the SCM. But in case of TN, sample preparation is more tedious and it has to be thoroughly prepared to get uh, better image. Otherwise, you'll end up with your TM slot without any image. So you have to really prepare your sample very, very nice. So in the next, the, the, the last lecture, I'll discuss three techniques mostly, surface characterization. So for whatever I told the X-ray and the depth in mostly bulk analysis or internal feature that you have studied. So in the case of next class, next class we'll study X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, electron spectroscopy, and secondary ion mass spectroscopy. So those techniques used for analysis of the surface layer. So that we will discuss in the next lecture. So if there is any questions on this, you can raise. Mm -hmm.